going to stick with that. Then what? Not so what. Then what? My message today will be based off of Luke chapter 12 and the story that Jesus references in that. Um, before we get there, I too want to just uh, offer a prayer before I share my message. Heavenly Father, uh, as always, it is clear and abundantly evident that there is no wisdom that resides in me that is worth being heard in this place. The only thing that's going to matter right now, Father, is that your voice is heard. So I just pray that you would use me as a vessel and that you would speak. And it wouldn't necessarily even be the words that I use, but the work of your Holy Spirit and the hearts and the minds of everyone that's here. We want your name to be uplifted and praised and worshipped. So God, please speak to us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, you're welcome to open your Bibles to Luke 12 just to familiarize yourself with the passage. Um, I'll be referencing it to some degree, but um, we're going to get into the story a little bit with our kids quiz. Um, and so I'm going to have my, is this one a good one? And then the black, those two good ones. So Sula and Toby, um, not a lot of young people in the church. There's a, a few that are around, but I always begin my messages with a little interactive time with the young people in the church called the kids quiz. Um, and so just raise your hand. I'd love to have your help. If, uh, if the kids are stumped, uh, we'll let the adults help out as well. So the story in Luke 12 that Jesus tells is the story of a man whose farms do so well, he has an overabundance of food. Do you remember in the story, what does he do with the extra food? Jesus tells it. Does he give it to the poor? He gives it to the Lord, builds bigger barns, or he has a big party. What does he do? See. See. <laughs> builds bigger barns to store it. You are correct, Nico. Thank you. An interesting story, isn't it? Was this man rich or poor before this event? Rich, poor, maybe we don't know. Does the story tell us? <laughs> All right. Eric? Rich. The Bible does say, very good, we're getting right into it. The Bible says he was rich to begin with. A rich man, farms did so well that he tore down his barns. What did God say to this man when he did this? He built his bigger barns. Does he say, great job, you've chosen wisely? Does he chastise him, you fool? Should have tithed first, you'll find rest? Uh, B. You calling me a fool? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, now notice, that's, that's correct. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you guys know your Bible so well. Remember, this is not a normal thing in most Jesus of, of Jesus' stories to use language like this, but he does. He says that God calls him, you fool. Last question. Looks like most of the young people, Sula, are over here. Just so, I'm, I'm just saying. Jesus ends the parable and the lesson with this statement. Where your treasure is, there your home will be also. Happiness, hope, heart. Just got to be quick on the dial. This young man, he knows what he's doing. D. Andre. What, what did you say? D. D? B. D. You're right. He says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Thank you, guys. You can just set the mics on the pew if you want. Do you remember this story? This story, it's a, it's a brief story. It pops up. And, and Jesus tells the story, and he ends it with this statement, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I want you to notice something. This message of Jesus is more about the heart than it is about the treasure. He uses treasure, but the message is more about the heart. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. An author, a motivational speaker, James Frick, he said, don't tell me where your priorities are. Show me where, you're, where you spend your money, and I'll tell you what they are. A lot of people, we think of our, it's, it's called self-deception, actually. We think, oh, I'm this type of person, I'm that type of person, this is what I do. But really, if you look at how we orient our economics, it really does illustrate a lot about where our heart truly lies. Luke chapter 12, it's not about money, it's about your heart. It's about your heart. That's what Jesus is interested in, your heart. Um, a lot of analysis and, and uh, uh, articles have been published on this idea that especially in the West and especially in the United States of America, we really are a society built on time and money. Time and money. Time and money is what drives much of the American way of life and the American way of thinking. You ever feel like you're constantly in a hurry? 
Many people live by the mantra, he who goes faster gets richer. He who goes faster gets richer. Huffington Post 2014, why we rush through life. When we're rushing, we're living in a state of resistance. It produces a state of consciousness that often comes about when we're feeling anxious. It's a lack of willingness to be in the present moment. Notice that. It's a lack of willingness to be in the present moment. Have you ever noticed how rushing implies a feeling of lack? Why do you rush? Because you lack some. I, I, I need more time. I, I need to, that position. I need to get there first. You rush. You hurry. You haste because you don't have or you don't think that you have. Therefore, you rush. Why we rush through life. New York Post, society's self-destructive addiction to faster living. We have an addiction to faster living. Psychology Today, 2015, rushing through life. How slowing down can help us find more time. You see how this has been a, a, an established element of research in our, in our society? Pew Research in 2016, who's feeling rushed? 76% of Americans say they always or sometimes feel rushed. And I know you can't really see the statistics while well, they're kind of blurry, but what sticks out about them? In every group that is studied, women tend to have this feeling of anxiety and rush more than men. Both of them are high, 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 high. But there's an even greater temptation or reality for feeling, for women, for feeling that they are rushed sometimes or all of the time. The, the documentary by National Geographic, Sleepless in America, exposes the crucial need for sleep and the shocking life-threatening consequences of its absence. Sleeplessness in America. Now, again, I know these statistics are kind of small, but just to get us in the mindset of where we're going here, Americans sleep on average two hours less than we did 150 years ago. On average, 150 years ago, we slept about eight hours. Now, the average American sleeps a little over six hours a night. 40% of all adults sleep less than seven hours, and even less Monday through Friday. Any, any, yeah? 40% uh, of night shift workers sleep less than, less than six hours. Night shift, brutal. Swing shift, brutal. 30% of all adult workers get less than six hours. 70% of adolescents are sleep deprived. Any teachers out there, sleep deprived kids, you know what that's like? This leads to analysis of drowsy driving and how we know how it's destroying so much of our society. 20% of car accidents, not alcohol, not road rage, sleep deprivation. They're drowsy. They fall asleep at the wheel or they're not paying attention, resulting in 1,500 deaths and 71,000 injuries every year just from lack of sleep. Billions of dollars of monetary loss, 32% reduced alertness with every 1.5 less hours of sleep. And those who sleep uh, around five hours, it's as bad as about a 0.05% blood alcohol level, which in many states is the equivalent of drunk driving. Not in Arizona, but it is in Utah. I looked it up. <laughs> Arizona, it's still 0.08. That's the national standard, 0.08. Um, but some states have lowered it to 0.05. And if you sleep with less than four hours, it's 0.10. 0.10. If, you, if you're driving and you've had less than four hours of sleep, you are the equivalent of uh, being drunk. You know, and in a lot of places, people use sleep deprivation almost as a badge of honor. There's, there's corporate places where people say, oh, I only got six hours of sleep. Like, oh, that's nothing. I only got five. Really? I only got four. Wow. You're really dedicated. You really are a hard worker. Right? You've heard that kind of thinking before? We use it as a, oh. And it really should be the opposite. It should be, well, that wasn't very smart. But instead, it's almost like a, that's dedication. You gave up your sleep because you're so dedicated. But it's dangerous and it's a, kill, a killer. A society built on time and money. We look for things to help us rush through life. Cell phones, fast food, email, voicemail, digital schedules, ATMs, express links, phone apps. Think about some of the most popular apps. Snapchat, right? Quick, instant messenger, Instagram. Everything's built on rush, quick. 
How many of you have sent a text where you're hoping for a reply and if you don't get it in five seconds, you're like stressed? Why don't they reply? Instant time. In 1967, expert testimony was given to the U.S. Congress that said because of all the technology, all the labor-saving devices that were coming out in the 60s, you know, space race, uh, uh, Cold War, all of the technology that was coming out, computers were in their infancy, right? Because of all this labor-saving technology, that within two or three decades, or about the year 2000, Americans were going to have more time than they would know what to do with. That they, they estimated that the average American would be working something like only 30 hours a week or something like only 30 weeks a year. How's that working for you? It's amazing how we have filled that extra time with other things. About that same time, about 1967, a new kind of restaurant was becoming very popular. It sold food based not on the quality of the food and not even on the pricing of the food, but on the fact that the food could be delivered quickly. And we called it fast food. I've got it right up there, right? Notice we didn't call it good food. We didn't even call it cheap food. It's called fast food. It's its own uh, uh, department of, of restaurants. But even with that, you still had to park your car, walk all the way into the restaurant, wait in line, order, then take the food over to the table and sit down. And that took too much time. So in our ingenuity in America, we invented something else. It's called the drive through lane, right? So families could eat in vans like God intended. That's what we did. Now, a doctor named Meyer Friedman, and I put him up here, who's actually the doctor who helped discover the link between type A personality and heart disease, says in our society that we suffer, suffer from something that he calls hurry sickness. Hurry sickness. He says it's actually a kind of disease, and it kills us physically, and it kills us spiritually. And my guess is that all of us who live in this society battle this disease in one form or another. So just to kind of level the playing field, I want us to do a little bit of a mass confession right now. I've already heard a, heard a few uh, agreements in the, in the uh, congregation today, as I've said, kind of a little bit of confession already. But I want to just ask, now everyone, if you feel that you suffer from hurry sickness in one way or another, if you just raise your hand and show that that is also something that you're struggling, just go ahead and raise your hand. You might even want to, oh, wait, 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 wait. You're in a hurry, I can tell, but we're gonna, I want to, I want to give a few more categories so you make sure you understand where we're going with this. Humor me for a moment, let's run through some categories. If this is you, and you find yourself feeling like there's just enough, not enough hours in the day, you wish you had more time, you often feel like you're in a race, and quite often you act like you're in a race as well. If this is you, sometimes when you come to an intersection and you see there are two lanes and there's a car in each lane, you look real close and hard at what those two cars are before you decide which one you're going to pull behind. You look at the make, the model, the year. You look at the driver. You look at their hair color. And you try to determine which of those cars is going to pull off that line faster because if you get behind the wrong car, you're kind of all depressed the rest of the day. If this is you, when you come to a grocery store and you're going to the checkout line and you have line A and you have line B and you're trying to decide which line to get into, you add up how many people are in line A, how many carts, how many items, uh, what's, how fast is the checker, right? Do you do that? And if you're really sick, when you get into line A, you watch who would have been you in line B and then you try, and if they get out of the store and you're still in line, you're kind of depressed for the rest of the day. I chose the wrong line. I had to stand in line for two more minutes. Okay, now is the time for mass confession. Do any of you raise your hand? Is this describing? You're a bunch of sick people. Sick. All of this results in us being an exhausted society. We live in a state of constant Exhaustion. Jesus one time wanted to talk about this tendency that even really smart human beings have to go real fast and do lots of stuff and miss out on what's central in life and not attend to what really matters. So in typical master teacher format, he tells a story. 
And this is the story that we referenced in the kids quiz earlier, and that's found in Luke chapter 12. But I'm going to contemporize the story a little bit. Tell it in the way that Jesus might have said it if he was living today. This is a story of a man who would be very much at home in our society, kind of a workaholic adventure capitalist. He knew the odds at getting a venture up and running it over a number of years, and that those odds are very low. But he was committed, and he was doing whatever it took to succeed, and it took everything. He found himself consumed by his work, 12, 14-hour days, working weekends. He joined professional organizations to expand his contacts. And even when he wasn't working, his mind was always on his work. So it wasn't just his occupation, but his pre-occupation. His wife would often try to tell him to slow down, to remember that he, has a, he had a family. And he was vaguely aware that his life was passing and that his kids were growing up and that he was missing it. And from time to time, they would co complain to him about games of catch they weren't playing or lunches that they weren't eating together or books that, that weren't being read to them. But after a while, they stopped complaining because they stopped expecting things would ever change. And he would tell himself, I'll be more available to my family in six months or so when things settle down. And although he was a very bright guy, this man in Jesus' story, he didn't seem to notice that things never settled down. Besides, he'd say to himself when he felt guilty, I'm doing it all for them. One morning, about one in the morning, he was awakened by a twinge in his chest, and his wife made an appointment with the doctor who told him that he'd had a slight heart attack. He told him that he had all the symptoms of, of a real problem. He had elevated blood pressure, high cholesterol. There needed to be some serious changes in his routine. And for a while there was. He bought some very expensive, very sophisticated equipment that monitored everything. His heart rate, BMI, cholesterol, uh, cholesterol, everything. And for a while he was careful, but after his symptoms went away, so did his motivation to change. And he said to himself, there'll be plenty of time for that in six months when things settle down. He recognized that his life is really out of balance. He thinks occasionally about God and the church. He makes sure his wife and kids go to church. But he says to himself, there'll be time for church in six months or so when things settle down. One day, the CEO of his company comes to this guy and says, you're not going to believe this, but things are booming to such an extent we can't keep up. This is our chance to strike the mother load. If we catch this wave, if we do this right, we'll be set for life. But it's going to require major changes. We've got inventory headaches around here you'd not believe. Orders are coming in faster than we can keep up. Our software is hopelessly outdated. If we don't overhaul this company, if you don't do something, it's going to be a total disaster. Now, from that time on, this man became like a man possessed. And when he goes home one evening, he says to his wife, you know what this means, don't you? Once I put us through this reorg, we can relax because our future will be, reassured, will be assured. We'll be set for life, he says. I know the market. I've covered every base. I've anticipated every contingency. We'll be financially secure. But she'd heard this before, and she didn't get her hopes up. About 11 o'clock that night, she decided to go to bed, and she asked him, are you coming with me? He said, no, you go ahead. I, I still have some things I want to do first. He was sitting in front of his computer. You go up first. I'll be right up. And so she did. She went to sleep. And when she woke up, she looked at the clock. It was about 3 a.m. In, in the morning, and he still hadn't come to bed. She walked downstairs, and she could see he was still sitting in front of his computer terminal with his head resting on his arm. She said, this is ridiculous. It's like being married to a kid. He'd rather fall asleep down here in front of the computer than come to bed. She went to touch him on the shoulder to wake him up, and bring him to get to, to bed, but his skin was cold and he did not respond to the touch of her voice. And she got that sick, panicky feeling in her stomach and called 911. But by the time the paramedics got there, they told her that he had a heart attack and had been dead for hours. His death was a major story in the community though. His obituary was written up in the major papers and it was too bad that he was dead because he would have loved to have read the wonderful things that were being said about him. They had a memorial service, and because he was so prominent, the whole community was there. They had a big service, and they got up to eulogize him. One of them said, he was an innovator. He was a master of business systems. Another one said, he was one of the leading entrepreneurs of his day. Another said, he was a man of principles and integrity. He, was a, he, he knew everybody. He was a networker. And they erected a memorial to him, and they wrote inspiring words upon the memorial. Leader, innovator, entrepreneur, visionary, success. 
especially that word success, because he had given his life for that word success. And then they buried his body, they put up the marker, and they all went home. When it was dark, there was no one present to observe, unseen, unheard, the angel of the Lord came to the cemetery. He made his way through the tombstones until he came to the place where the man had been buried. And there with his finger, he traced his word on that memorial to describe that man. And you know what that word was? Fool. You fool, God says. That's Jesus' story. Now you have to ask your question, you have to ask yourself a question. Why such harsh language? I don't think Jesus is engaging in name calling. He's not speaking out of anger. I think Jesus is making a tragically accurate diagnosis of this man's life. Because for all of his entrepreneurial genius, because of all of his business brilliance, through all of his cost benefit analysis and cash flow projections that he ran, the one scenario he forgot to take into account was that he was going to die. It was his death. He forgot he was going to die. And God stands amazed at the folly of any human being, no matter how smart, who painstakingly prepares for every contingency, covers every base, for every eventuality, no matter how unlikely, and then forgets that one inevitable certainty that stares us all in the face, which is, I am going to die one day. He neglected to plan for the most obvious and inescapable fact of human existence. Despite all the modern technological advances in medicine and science, disease prevention, dietary lifestyle, holistic health programs, the human mortality rate still stands at an astonishing 100%. What other word, Jesus asks, do you use to describe such folly? A human being so busy busy building up his little kingdom as if it were, were to endure forever, that he doesn't have any time for the kingdom of God, which will endure forever. He's so busy making a living, he forgets to make a life. It's known as rich fool's syndrome. Okay, that's all right. We'll survive. It's characterized by two illusions that were very prominent in this man's life and are very prominent in our day. The first one is captured in this man's favorite phrase, when things settle down. I'll get around to matters one day when things settle down. Don't worry about it, guys. Don't worry about it, we'll be fine. Let me ask you a question. When will things settle down? When you die. Things are going to settle way down when you die. You're going to be amazed how much things settle down when they put you in the ground, guys. Now, I'm not saying there's not a time for relaxation, there's not a time for vacation, but this life is not a life where things settle down. Things will always be on our agenda. Things will always be pressuring us from one side or the another. Or, or another. Things will not settle down. And if you wait to get around to what really matters, you will never do what God made you to do. You will never become who God made you to become. Your soul will wither and die. Things do not settle down. No one else will do this for you. Not your boss, not your spouse, not your kids, not your parents. You must do this. The other illusion that the rich man struggled with as part of rich man syndrome is the idea that more will be enough. More will be enough. If I just had a little more, then it'll be enough. If I just get, keep getting more, it'll lead to contentment. We kill ourselves for more. More choices, more experiences, more successes, more stuff. We're bombarded every day by millions of messages that tell us more eventually will lead to, commit, will lead to contentment. 
And we get stuff we don't even know what to do with. You want to know what the, one of the fastest growing businesses are? Mini storage. Mini storage. They're popping up everywhere. Because we filled our garages, we filled our attics, we filled our lives, and we've got so much stuff that we don't know where to put it. So we have to get more storage. Now there's a time and place. Don't any of you who have mini storage right now, please don't throw stones. There's a time and place for it. I get it. But if it's simply an outgrowth of I've got so much, I can't even, I just have to fill it more is what we're bombarded with. More will never be enough. But we live in this insane world that somehow thinks it will. If I could just make more. The writer of, of scriptures, Paul says, I have learned the secret of being content in any situation when I live with God. When I live with God, I've learned the secret of contentment. Now, years ago, I'm, 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 I'm getting to that point where I'm starting to date myself. Years ago, James Dobson did a great illustration of this by using the game Monopoly. Do any of you know of Monopoly? Have ever played Monopoly? It's a game of acquisition. Most people don't like it because it takes so long to play. But when I was growing up playing Monopoly, I didn't really know how to play it uh, with my friends. Uh, we would play it because we just, you know, we'd get the money and, oh, it was so good to have the money. And then we would be really selective which properties we wanted to buy. Oh, I don't like those properties. They're green. I don't like green properties. I want the red. Pro you know, we made these silly, and, and so we didn't really play it right. But my dad, who my dad doesn't really play board games a lot, but sometimes we'd beg him and he would play um, Monopoly with me. And every time he would wipe me out. He would just wipe, because my dad understood how to play the game. He, every property he landed on, he bought, no matter what color it was, no matter how much it cost. When he bought it, he would mortgage it, and I didn't even know what that meant, but all of a sudden he had more money because he mortgaged it, and he would put houses and hotels, and with, and, you know, normally Monopoly, it takes a long time. Not when I played dad. Within a few minutes, I would be landing on everything, and he'd be like, all right, 500 more, 200 more, 300 more, and eventually he would wipe me off the board. I hate losing. I hate losing. So one summer, I decided I am going to master the game Monopoly. So I spent all summer playing Monopoly with my friends. And they kept doing their little thing of, oh, that's the pink property, don't buy that. And oh, I want this railroad or not. And I would just buy everything. And I wiped them out every time. I learned how to play the game Monopoly that summer. And so that fall, I said, Dad, let's play Monopoly. So we sat down, we started to play, and we bought, and we bought, and we acquired, and we mortgaged, and we bought, and I was really wanting to get Park Place and Boardwalk. I got all the railroads, I got all the utilities, and I finally got both Boardwalk and Park Place. I started packing houses and hotels on them, and I'll never forget, it happened at Park Place. I counted up how many spaces it took for my dad to land on that. He rolled the dice. It came out those number of spaces. He came and he landed on Park Place. I looked. I saw his money. I saw how much I was going to collect from him. I love my dad. You know, he coached my sports teams. He supported our family. Hard-working guy. Good man. I took everything he had. I took it all. I said, you give it to me, give it to me now. And I, I wiped him off the board, and I was now master of the board. I had won Monopoly fought finally against my father. And I stood back, and I just relished that moment. And I said, I now own it all. And my dad said, very good, son. But then he had one more lesson to teach me. He said, now let's put it back in the box. I didn't want to put it back in the box. I wanted to leave. I wanted my mom to see it when she came home from grocery shopping. I wanted to show my sister. I wanted my friends to come over and to see this empire of houses and hotels and properties that I've owned. I didn't want to put it in the box. My dad said, no. The game is over. And you've played the game well. And there's nothing wrong with playing the game well, guys. Nothing wrong with playing the game well. But at the end of the game, everything goes back in 
the box. This man in Jesus' story, he played the game well. He just forgot that the game ends. And when the game ends, it all goes back in the box. He was a shrewd guy, this man in Jesus' story. He just forgot how the game ends. And every day you pick up the newspaper. Every day you look at the news and you find out for who the game has ended. Shelley Duvall just died. You know who she is? The game ended. Every day the game ends. And one day the time will come that our game ends. We read about skilled businessmen, an aging grandmother, teenage kids who think they have the whole world in front of them, and then somebody drives through a stop sign. It all goes back in the box. Houses, cars, titles, clothes, filled barns, bulging portfolios, even your body. Now, there's an alternative road you can go down if you want to. This story that Jesus told has been lived out millions and millions of times. You don't even have to believe the Bible to believe the story that he told. You can read it for yourself. Bill Hybels wrote this. All he ever wanted was more. He wanted more money, so he parlayed inherited wealth into a billion-dollar pile of assets. He wanted more fame, so he broke into the Hollywood scene and soon became a filmmaker and star. He wanted more sensual pleasures, so he paid handsome sums to indulge his every sexual urge. He wanted more thrills, so he designed, built, and piloted the fastest aircraft in the world. He wanted more power, so he secretly dealt political favors so skillfully that two U.S. presidents became his pawns. All he ever wanted was more. He was absolutely convinced that more would bring him true satisfaction. Unfortunately, history shows otherwise. This man concluded his life emaciated, colorless, sunken chest, fingernails and grotesque inches, long corkscrew, uh, long corkscrew inch fingernails, rotting black teeth, tumors, and innumerable needle marks from his terrible drug addiction. You know who I'm talking about? Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes died believing the myth, of a, the myth of more, a billionaire junkie, insane by all reasonable standards. It's the same story. You have to ask yourself the question. If Howard Hughes had pulled off one more deal, one more million dollars, one more powerful politician in his pocket, would it have been enough? Would it ever have been enough? She was the most admired woman of her day. Every man wanted her. Every woman envied her. But Marilyn Monroe died alone, died at her own hand. And you have to ask yourself the question, if she'd had one more hit movie, graced one more magazine cover, had one more sexual relationship with a powerful man, would it have been enough? Suppose Gina and I were to say, or or suppose I was to say to Gina that she was going to take a credit card one day, no ceiling on it, go to the mall, buy everything she wanted to, just an absolute spending spree, every dress, every pair of shoes, every every expensive item, all day long. Would it be enough? We'll never know, will we? (laughs) How far do you have to walk down that road, Jesus asks. Before you see where it leads, surely you understand it will never be enough. There's a simple two-word question that the man in Jesus' story never asked himself. And that question is the title of my sermon. Then what? Then what? He thought his problem was that he had too much stuff and not enough closet space. His assumption was that his wealth would last. He just needed a place to put it. And he never thought to ask himself, when I finally have enough, when the barn is full and I'm financially secure, then what? When you finally get the ultimate possession, when you've made the ultimate purchase, when you buy the ultimate home, when you've stored up the financial security, climbed the ladder of success to the highest rung you can possibly climb, and you've done all all of it, and the thrill wears off, and the thrill will wear off, Then what? What are you going to do with a cold marriage? With friends and family that you've become distant from? Because they've learned that they're not as important as a career, a job, a briefcase, a barn full of stuff. How important will that stuff be? Don't you know, God asks, how quickly life passes? Don't you know? 
And Jesus says anybody who goes through life, no matter how well they played the game, and doesn't prepare for that moment is not smart. So you have to ask, you're ready. You have to ask yourself the question, are you ready for that moment? Are you ready for that moment? Are you living your life before God in such a way that when that moment comes, you will look back on a life of wisdom? Or are you walking down a road that will lead to major regret? Who is in control of your life? Right now, who's in control? Is it God? Is it yourself? Is it money? Would you close your eyes as we close? Just do me this favor. We don't do this often here, but if you're willing to do that with me, just close your eyes for a moment. Even though there are a lot of people around right now, this is just a moment between you and God, a a private moment as much as possible. And I just want to ask you some questions. Are you playing a game right now? What road are you walking down? Are there any illusions that has its hooks in you? Are you playing the game of when things settle down? Are you caught in the illusion that more will someday be enough? As long as we're on this planet, God has a plan for us. And the things of this earth do not settle down, friend. And all that will last for eternity is God and the people that he loves so much. That's all. And one day, you will stand before that God. Are you living in such a way that you're ready for that moment. By the grace of Christ, this is not about earning that place and being secure in our own merits. But trusting in Jesus as your Savior, are you ready for that moment? When your last minute is spent on earth, as death takes you, or as we see Christ arrive in the clouds of glory at the second coming, then what will really matter to you? Father, I know we've gone down a kind of convoluted trail today of illustrating this story in a a different way and using modern day analogies. But Father, the principle is still the same. And to one degree or another, we all do suffer from hurry sickness. And in one degree or another, we all have that rich man's syndrome. And every now and then, Lord, we need a moment to review our priorities. And to step back and to see the direction that our life is going. Lord, I pray that we would have the wisdom to avoid these traps that our society lays at our feet all the time. We don't want to be like this man in the story that you told in Luke chapter 12. It's wonderful to have resources and be blessed, but help us not to make that our ultimate focus and priority. Help us always to set your kingdom and your righteousness first and foremost. Remind us that we have a job to do for your eternal kingdom. That's where our focus should be. Thank you that we've had this moment together. Bless us with your Holy Spirit. Send us down the path you would have us go. And may your spirit guide us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.